This program is brought to you by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu. It's a pleasure to introduce um, Christine Scotty. Um, Christine um, received her PhD in biomedical engineering uh, just last year from Carnegie Mellon uh, University, working with um, Professor um, uh, Ammon and Professor Fanal. Um, and uh, was, has been working, was working actually directly in this area of using computational methods for understanding fluid-solid interactions uh, related uh, to uh, abdominal aortic aneurysms and now is, uh, is uh, working on uh, translating some of these technologies and developing maybe new technologies um, for uh, endovascular graft design and uh, we'll be talking about some of those uh, today. Well, good afternoon. I appreciate you all uh, hang, uh, hanging around for the final presentation. There's definitely certain advantages and disadvantages. Um, one being the final presentation is that I've heard a lot of great research over the last two days and uh, hopefully can incorporate some of those ideas into what I talk about today. However, the two marked disadvantages are that, first of all, um, you run the risk of repetition. So I'll try not to overemphasize too many points. Uh, and secondly, I realize I'm what's standing between you and dinner and the rest of your weekend. So I'll try to be concise in my comments today. As I said, there was a lot of really great research involved, and I wanted to talk today about computational fluid dynamics, because I think it can serve as a very nice link between biomechanics and biology and helping to, um, f to develop endovascular graphs in these future, future designs. So if I could subtitle my talk today, it would be that computational fluid dynamics is more than just a pretty picture. And this is how we're used to typically looking at fluid results. Um, this is actually from a fluid structure interaction study. And so we're look, used to looking at red being fast blood flow or high, wall shear, or high shear stress, rather, and blue areas being low quantities. However, there's a lot more to be learned from just looking at these gradients and how fluid dynamics can help in understanding what's going on within a AAA. Uh, Dr. Zarens and, and Dr. Dalman have done a very nice job of highlighting some of this history. So I just wanted to kind of give the perspective that um, over these last 20 years, as these devices have evolved, there's been substantial design changes, both in terms of materials and structures, stent designs, attachment mechanisms, uh, whether or not they are modular devices or unibody devices. Um, and the question would remain then, are we actually there yet? Have we developed a perfect or suitable endovascular graft? And as Dr. Zarens pointed out, Graph migration and type 1 endoleaks are two very crucial failure modes of these devices, and they are still prevalent. I tried to blind for the, uh, the data here so that no particular company or, or device is, is shown as better or worse. And what you can see is that, yes, endoleak type 1 occurs across the board regardless of fixation device, as does graph migration. And so to attack these failure modes, we're kind of looking at this from two different perspectives. The first is from an FEA structural perspective, as well as these biological markers which have been discussed over the last two days. And so kind of combining the two, we look at the attachment mechanism as well as the effect on neck morphology. Uh, are you going to impose uh, neck dilatation by your attachment mechanism? Uh, is putting a device in an already angulated neck going to increase the propensity of some sort of device failure, as Dr. Zarens mentioned? However, fluid dynamics also offers some correlation here uh, in terms of biological markers and the propensity for cellular deposition as well as its contribution to disease progression. And also, fluid structure interaction can provide some very useful information combining both fluid dynamics and FEA and looking at the effects of compliance. So it's really in totality, looking at all three of these entities, which you're going to give, get the most information in terms of de designing for endovascular grass. And uh, the only way I could really think of an analogy that would be of local interest anyway to depicting the importance of all three of these fa features is to use the example of Lombard Street. Uh, if those of you who are local or familiar with this, a two-dimensional representation is going to give you, you know, directions on how to get there and maybe some preparation for the S-curves that you're going to encounter. However, in actuality, there's a 27-degree grade to Lombard Street, and it becomes much more difficult to navigate. I would use a very similar analogy for endovascular graph design and using these different tools, that looking at any one or two of these combinations is only really going to give you two-dimensional information, which can be useful for certain aspects, but is not going to give you the complete picture. So how do we go about doing this? How can we incorporate these computational tools in endovascular graph design? And this is the typical flow diagram, if you will, that you start with some experimental or analytical data, develop a prototype device, and go through a somewhat iterative process trying to do, uh, develop your prototype, take those results, go back to an experimental or analytical analysis back and forth, 
However, computational tools can really help make this a more efficient process. Rather than taking the time and cost to build these devices, you're now able to use these inputs in a computational model and develop predictive models. Uh, one such example would be even the use for fluid dynamics of particle image velocimetry versus your computational model. Obviously, you can't use particle image velocimetry with a device planted in there. You won't be able to see your vectors, but maybe it would help indicate areas where you can develop increased resonance time, which kind of a correlation to biological markers, um, or additional features, which I think have been talked about today. So some background on what experimental and analytical data is useful out there. Well, as most of you are probably familiar, there is this control volume approach looking at, again, a two-dimensional uh, representation, calculating the forces acting on the inlet and outlets to generate an overall displacement forces. And as Dr. Zarens mentioned, there's been a couple of different iterations of this, all of which have considered planar geometries, never considering out-of-plane curvature. Uh, Lee and Kleinstor just looked at neck angulation, and Dr. Morris actually incorporated some compliance at the inlets and outlets to his analyses, however neglected certain angulation features. Is this truly presenting the complete picture? Well, as we know, aneurysms are much more complex in nature, and so when you start to add in neck angulation, iliac angulation, and anterior curvature, these forces become much more complicated to, to uh, calculate and will affect your endovascular graft design. Uh, and this study shows the increased likelihood of neck dilation when you start to look at neck angulation. Uh, maybe this is another chicken and egg question, which comes first, but uh, certainly you, you run the risk of affecting your graft design and attachment mechanism with severe angulation. Also, I would ask then, as these structural components have been talked about over these last two days in biological markers, is a device that is attached to a healthy neck that looks like this in its biological structure going to perform the same, same way as when it's attached to something like this? Uh, this particular study took this sample, I believe, from an open repair, and it appeared to be a healthy aortic neck. Uh, and then they did this, this, this uh, analysis on it and discovered that there's been quite a bit of degradation. And so what are we actually attaching our devices to? And how does that affect these displacement forces? Uh, one final point is the development of standards. Uh, there's been a lot of great work that's been presented, and I think the more we develop these correlations and show repeatability, the more it's going to help all of us. Uh, this is just one example of fluid dynamic indicators and how it might correlate to some sort of standard development. Uh, this was just taken from the literature showing these physiological values. However, at high wall shear stress, you run the risk of initiating certain cascades with leukocyte and platelet activations. And at a lower wall shear stress, you run the risk of intimal hyperplasia development. Can this be used in endovascular graft design or any medical device design for that matter? Um, and these standards have yet to be fully developed. Uh, as I mentioned to Dorothy, uh, the FDA is going to get a little bit of a mention here that finite element analysis has been around for a long time, and so there's a lot of standards in the FDA and guidances for how to use that for medical device design. However, when you type in computational fluid dynamics, you don't get any kind of guidance whatsoever, and while shear stress yields one result for hemodialysis and devices. So there's not really much in terms of developing a standard for how fluid dynamics can assist you. And I think these last two days have shown that there are a lot of opportunity out there for developing some sort of standard for how an endovascular graph can, or any medical device can be improved. This kind of just overemphasizes that point that fatigue has yielded over 30, or excuse me, over 60 records in terms of FDA standards, but things typically associated with biological markers, while shear stress um, yields very few things in regards to FDA guidance, and we know that correlations exist, and there's improving methodologies all the time to develop these correlations. Uh, so in summary, I guess what I would like to say for CFD analyses and how it can be applied to endovascular graft needs, the first is the need for accurate morphology and taking that into consideration. Uh, there's some talk today about imaging modalities and keeping that in mind when you're looking at limitations. If you're trying to measure a displacement that is beyond your resolution, or I'm sorry, within your resolution, can you actually say that you're measuring a displacement force? Uh, this was my lone equation since it is at Friday afternoon. Uh, the displacement forces require the use of accurate pressure calculations. Uh, pressure is going to be a driving force regardless of what you're looking at for a displacement, and using some sort of an accurate outlet boundary condition is going to help in that prediction, as well as when you begin to couple these entities and look at arterial displacement and how compliance mismatch, for example, might contribute to graft fixation. There is a natural coupling when it comes to endovascular grafts and AAAs, and adding compliance to the inlet and outlet, as I mentioned, Dr. Moore showed that displacement forces increase by as much as 60% when you start to look at just a little bit of compliance. As these devices continue to evolve and their structure continues to change, can we still assume that they're a rigid walled entity 
and can we start to look at how compliance might affect these displacement forces. I always encourage the use of fluid structure interaction because it can really help understand these complex dynamics, including the significance at the attachment site, considering things like pulse wave comp propagation, compliance mismatch, uh, as well as linking these fluid dynamics with biological indicators in the arterial wall. And finally, as I said, the development of an acceptance criteria. And so this is my final slide, which just kind of highlights where we're at now and where we could be. Um, this is kind of the current tool set where you're looking at in CFD, steady state rigid wall calculations for endovascular graphs, which are sufficient for certain design considerations, of course, um, so as is the use of FEA and experimental <coughs> testing. But to truly generate the entire picture and maybe to really uh, continue to add to the de design evolution process, you should consider much more entities, how they interact with each other. Even a couple of these interacting with each other can really give you a lot more information and hopefully help design a more a safer and more effective endovascular graft. So with that, I thank you for your attention and welcome any questions. Thank you. Um, great presentation. I was just curious, is there a particular solver that you work with or that you, you recommend or have you tried several different ones? What sort of um, limitations do those offer? Uh, there's definitely certain limitations for each of them. I've, I've worked with Adina before I came to Gore. I work with Fluent now. Um, it really kind of depends on what you're looking at um, to, to fully evaluate them. If you want to use FSI, uh, there's a lot of different codes out there that can do it. Um, and if you're just looking at fluid dynamics, there's a couple of codes which kind of offer all some very similar things. Yes. Christine, what do you think the chances are for developing an even larger package which encompasses fluids and structures and biological response all in one huge computational overview? He wants to incorporate fluid, biology, and mechanical simulations all in one giant solution package, which I think I've reviewed in one of your grants as a home run idea. Do you want to comment on that? That's a great idea. <laughs> so, obviously, uh, Charlie and I have, um, have been working toward that now for a few years, and um, I guess the, the point I made yesterday is and I agree completely with, with your comments. I, I really appreciated that. But I think that as we introduce devices into, the, into any vessel, um, we know that vessel is going to adapt. And so we need to include in that ad adaptation, which means to link. So I'd have one more maybe circle uh, in, in, your, in your diagram. But obviously the fluid-solid interaction, the wall mechanics, the mechanobiology, and what we call this growth or adaptation. So uh, it's an ambitious goal, but I think that's what we need to work toward. The preceding program is copyrighted by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu.